All right, it's another episode with libertarianprogressive.com, blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel, where we interview independent and third party candidates who are on the ballots and the only third party candidates who are on the ballots in their specific district or area or states. And if you go to our website, libertarianprogressive.com, by the end of this weekend, we'll have more than 20 candidates, probably about 22, 23, 24. And another week or so, we'll have 50 plus candidates that you can see as alternate solutions, options, besides Republican or de- Democrat. Uh, most of these are for Congress. Today, we have an interview with uh, Frank Gilbert, who is a libertarian, who is on the ballot for the U.S. Senate in Arkansas. And you can uh, read more about him at frankgilbertforsenate.com. And uh, and so if you're looking for an alternate, um, you know, most polls say that, uh, you know, people would like to throw them all out. Well, um, and that means the Congress. I mean, we don't really get into presidential politics with libertarianprogressive.com. It's very divisive, very polarizing. All right, so here we have Frank calling in right now. Let's uh, bring him online. So, Frank, uh, good good day. I actually gave you an introduction. Um, this will be rebroadcast later at libertarianprogressive.com. And, again, people, we are talking with Frank Gilbert, uh, Frank Gilbert for Senate.com, Libertarian candidate for U.S. Senate in Arkansas, and uh, he's the only third-party option uh, for Senate uh, in that state. And so, welcome, Frank. Good to talk with you today. Oh, my pleasure, and I appreciate your patience. Yeah, well, uh, we appreciate you um, putting yourself on the ballot, so we can have this interview with you, and that your potential constituents will have a. Uh, another option. And so may I ask you, um, you know, there's so many Republicans and Democrats in government, and, but in fact, actually, most people are registered as independent uh, overwhelmingly. But why are you choosing to run as a libertarian, not a Republican or a Democrat this year? Well, uh became familiar with the Libertarian Party back in 1980 when Ed Clark ran a presidential campaign. Read, ran some really interesting uh, two-minute ads on national television uh, thanks to his vice presidential candidate, one of the Koch brothers. Um, spent some personal money in the campaign. And uh, at the time, I was a Goldwater Republican, uh, liked some of the things that, that Ed said, and uh, thought that the, he, like most libertarians, were just confused, you know, didn't, didn't understand the, <laughs> the reality of the world. But over the next couple of years, it became obvious to me that the Republican candidate that I had voted for in 1980 hadn't, hadn't been truthful. And so I went back and got in touch with some local libertarians who uh, helped me to understand that it wasn't uh, libertarians who were confused, but it was me. You know, that if you, if you want liberty for yourself, you have to be willing to give it to everybody else. And uh, once once you realize that, it becomes an easy thing to become a libertarian. And um, philosophically, remained a libertarian even when I joined the Republican Party a few years later with a group called the Republican Liberty Caucus. We were going to go in and take over the Republican Party and make it more libertarian. And that didn't work out well either. Huh? So uh, returned to my libertarian roots in 2012 and ran for the state senate here in Arkansas and have been been running for some elective office as a libertarian ever since. Not so much in the uh, expectation of being elected to that office, but in the hopes of uh, spreading the message that Ed Clark did to me lo these many years ago. And uh, the best way for me to do that is to stand for office, uh, go to debates, go on speaking tours, and just talk to people who live their everyday lives like libertarians, but don't have the choice of voting that way. Yeah, well, what I've, uh, and thanks for um, giving people an option to vote that way. Uh, instead of having to write someone in, um, you know, you're actually on the ballot. And what I've observed is it appears to me a lot of people who are one of the major parties 
use it as a stepping stone. A lot of times they don't even finish their term because, you know, that stepping stone. And um, and a lot of people who are third-party candidates, whether you agree with them fully or not, you can admire, um, you know, they're doing it for the right reasons, it seems. Uh, either they're principled, they believe in competition, you know, they see something that they don't uh, – is just not right and um so well let's look at your uh, platform here i mean you have your website frank gilbert for senate.com home about platform news donates contacts and on your platform um you know it says things like fiscal responsibility and, and a paragraph to explain that non-interventionist foreign policy respect the 10th amendment the second amendment close the department of education close the department of homeland security and end the IRS. So how about let's start with the bottom up. I mean, end the IRS. Um, yeah. How, what would you, re, would you replace it with anything? What would you do uh, for revenue and um, spending instead of the IRS? And why would you replace the IRS? Or, or well, it? the IRS, the, the IRS is probably the most intrusive and one of the most corrupt departments of our federal government. You know, what they did to the Tea Party folks uh, was criminal, and they've gotten by with it so far and probably will continue to. It also uh, opens up a degree of control for the federal government through its tax policy that uh, free people shouldn't put up with. I certainly would change, you know, something. Um, I'm not an anarchist yet, uh, so the government has to have the income, has to have the ability to do those things that we expect the government to do until we decide that the free market can do it better. And uh, I tell my friends when I hear them arguing about which tax solution is better, you know, I'll go with the fair tax, flat tax, free tax, no tax. Any any solution um, is better than what we have now because the IRS, as it's currently constituted, is is a, a tyranny that just has to be ended, and nearly anything we do would be better. Yeah, so um, there definitely needs to be some kind of reform and change. I mean, the uh, IRS code is huge, and um, yeah, it a lot of people spend a lot of time working on it, and, and when you hear the word IRS audit, it just sends chills up your spine, and, you know, it's supposed to be a service of we the people and not something that's... Uh, you know, scares you. And um, right. and so what about the Department of Homeland Security? Um, you know, that's a new department that was opened up uh, around 2002, I think. Um, and mm -hmm. so you, your stance is to close it. Yeah. Yes. And, and again, there just has to be a better way to do that. Lord knows we've got enough uh, federal and state legal authorities, law enforcement um, departments that could do it. Uh, private security had done it before 9-11 and in the aftermath of the attacks in New York and Pennsylvania and D.C. Uh, as people often do when they're shocked and afraid, we overreacted. And uh, I remember those days that right after there were troops in airports all over the United States. And that's clearly a violation of the Posse Comitatus but nobody was talking about that. Everybody wanted to feel secure, and so we did that. And uh, then we carried that overreaction into setting up the Department of Homeland Security. And it has turned into what government agencies most frequently do. It's, it's a farce. It doesn't provide what it's supposed to, security, from the types of threats that it was established for. And instead, you have uh, federal employees acting like teenage boys and and using highly expensive and intrusive equipment uh, to stare at naked women and men. Uh, the pat-downs that they do of uh, children and old people is just just insane. And uh, there, are, there are ways to protect the flying public. I think Israel does so without as much fanfare or as expense as we do. And lots of other countries uh, do it better than we do without intruding on their citizens' rights. And Lord knows we did it before 9-11 in a much better fashion. I'd rather see us go back to what we were doing before and just be more alert, 
and more aware. Yeah, there were FBI agents on the trail of those um, terrorists that you know committed 9/11, and I guess the Department yes. of Homeland Security was supposed to be a central place where different departments like the FBI and CIA can communicate. But instead, it's like a huge department that costs, you know, probably more than all of those departments put together. So maybe there should be a way for like FBI, CIA to communicate better or for whistleblowers, you know, some people lower on the chain of command to, you know, fast track some things that they think are are red alert type material. Um, Exactly. And uh, I mean, because they were definitely on the trail of all of these people. I mean, so we just didn't listen to them, and uh, and mm-hmm. maybe for political reasons. Uh, what do you think about whistleblowers like Edward Snowden or other people? I mean, it seems like if you were a whistleblower, you know, you it probably be a dangerous thing. I mean, you might get fired, you might get shunned, you might go to jail in some cases. I mean, so it's not easy right now being a whistleblower for someone who wants to expose corruption in the system. I mean, but we probably should, uh, you, you know, have more, you know, an, an avenue for people to do something like that. If they, you know, cause who would know what's corrupt besides better than some of the people that are honest that are working inside these systems. Exactly. And we've set up, um, uh, you know, on the bus programs within departments and ombudsmans and all those things that are supposed to facilitate those kind of, whistleblower um, actions, but instead they have become exactly what what they were before uh, without the ombudsman and the extra expense. Uh, the department polices itself, you know, there's there's not an outside entity that is, is, is assigned to come in and look and see if the whistleblower is a disgruntled employee or former employee or if he, he or she actually has information uh, they could save money or lives or anything else. They're, you're exactly right. Probably the bravest people in in the United States right now are those who are willing to put their jobs and their future on the line to try to make something good happen, to correct some uh, error or some wrong in the system. And just like Snowden, most often they are pushed aside, punished, uh, and and ultimately ignored. Uh, Snowden, I believe, is a is a hero. Now, obviously, I don't know everything about that situation, but what I do know is that the government habitually lies when caught doing something wrong. Uh, from Richard Nixon forward, and probably before that, the government and, and individuals in governance always react in the same way. Well. It's it's their fault, you know. Somebody who's who's trying to do the right thing is made to be the culprit and accused in this case of treason. I I don't believe it for a minute. Yeah, yeah, and 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 as far as security, sometimes just better hardware like uh, cockpit doors that would help. Um, you know the uh, yeah ha- having just a security officer on the plane who is authorized to have a you know a weapon or something i mean just simple that doesn't violate people's mm-hmm. civil liberties but it for sure would stop any terrorism um and uh well um and so let's look at some of the other issues here um you had here um uh, let's see well what let me ask you while be, while i'm looking at some of these issues here what about debates or mm-hmm. ha, are have you been in any of the debates are there debates coming up that you're going to be a part of rank Yes, we've been fortunate. Uh, the Republican incumbent is doing what, you know, incumbents in a state like Arkansas where a Republican is, is expected to be reelected. He's avoiding all the debates. Uh, he's agreed to go to one, the ATN, the local, uh, well, the statewide affiliate of the public education section is holding one debate that they do every year, and, and it is such a part of the political background here in Arkansas that he can't avoid it. So we'll have that in October, and uh, AETN has always been good since Greens and Libertarians started getting on the ballot here. They invite everybody to their debates. So I'll be in a three-way debate with the Republican and the Democrat in October, 
the Democrat and I had a debate in Fayetteville last two weeks ago now and uh, had an empty podium there for the senator if he bothered to show up, but of course he didn't. And we'll have another one the 30th of September in central Arkansas, somewhere around the Little Rock area, and perhaps one more um, after the AETN debate on, I believe, the 13th of October. So well, that sounds really, really good, and I appreciate hearing that. And um, so uh, you also have here closed the Department of Education, and um, so uh, so that's a, that might sound a little controversial, but maybe it's not. Uh, can you tell us about that? Sure. It's not as controversial as it sounds because it doesn't really change that much uh, as far as education goes. I, I did over 20 years in private business and in the second act of my life um, have had the pleasure of working at the Boxside Public Schools in Boxside, Arkansas and uh, it is a day and night change to the first <laughs> act of my life and one of the things that strikes anybody when you get into government education is the fact that the government at each level adds funding to the educational process. The local school district uh, applies about 25 to 30 percent of the money in, in Arkansas, and the state government does about 55 or 60 percent of it. 10 or 15 percent of the funds come from the federal government. And with that money comes control. And the degree of control that the federal government has over the local schools here in Arkansas is, is becoming greater and greater, even though the financial contribution they're making is not. Uh, some of that is complicity between the State Department of Education and the Federal Education Department. Uh, bureaucrats like bureaucrats, and, and they, they get along well together as they make their, their forward plans and their programs for uh, education, supposedly. But lost in all of that is the local teacher, and the local administrator, the local taxpayer, the local school board. Um, getting the federal government out of education would not have the impact that most people believe it would have on local education. Even if they took their money back, there would be ways uh, to work around that because in some cases, the money that you get from the federal government actually costs you more as you begin to have to comply with their regulations and their reporting requirements and all of the strings that are attached to it. But if they wanted to do block grants, you know, if you took the money that the education department gets every year now and quit paying the D.C. bureaucrats and instead sent most of that and probably more of that money uh, back to the states and block grants, I believe education would actually get more money and would begin to reflect those things in localities that are important to the people in the community. Right, and um, it kind of reminds me, I saw a stat that I did not know the other day, um, but since we, America, I think through Nixon or, or Lyndon Johnson declared a war on uh, poverty, um, uh, the poverty level has remained exactly the same, <laughs> and um, and we've spent trillions of dollars. We could have just given the money directly to the people who are in poverty. And sometimes I think about education. We spend about twelve thousand per student on average. Some places more, some mm -hmm. less. But if you gave every student twelve thousand dollars a year, they could, you know, you could get ten of them that could hire a teacher for a hundred thousand dollars a year. Some top notch you know, brainiac person. I mean, so, yeah, there's a lot of um, ways to think about it. I mean, um, well, and on here you have here respect the Second Amendment and um, and also respect the Tenth Amendment. Uh, those are two separate amendments, but maybe you could, uh, you know, talk about both of those issues one at a time or together. Sure, and, and probably just the Constitution in general. I think we've, we have lost sight of the fact that the Constitution is a compact between 50 states and an entity, the federal government, that they established a couple of hundred years ago. We are not like France, you know, 
the the national government of France does not set up districts. I mean, and that's what they do in France. The national government sets up districts and, and operates through those districts, but it's like a business. You know, you have your CEO, you have your local and, and regional offices and, and um, administrators who run those. The United States was not set up that way and shouldn't be operating that way now. We are to look at the Constitution for what it is, the underlying law of the land, the way we govern our relationships between the states and the federal government and the individuals in the state, then it becomes a lot easier to protect individual liberty and, and freedom. The Second Amendment is under attack more than any other, I believe. And the reason is, is varied. Some people honestly believe that we need to be disarmed, that only the, the Army and um, police should have guns. And from that extreme to the center uh, of the current debate, there are people who would change the Second Amendment if they could. But the process for changing the Second, the Second Amendment is clear. The Constitution has been amended before, and it's always done the same way the way we all agreed to in the beginning. The uh, states or the federal government can uh, propose a constitution, and then that proposed amendment is sent back to the states, and three-quarters of the states have to approve it. There is, no, there is nothing that anybody could propose to change the Second Amendment that would pass in three-quarters of the states. So instead, they undermine the Second Amendment they pass legislation that is clearly unconstitutional. Uh, the, the courts and uh, well-meaning or ill-meaning judges, doesn't really matter, um, uphold those laws. It reminds me of what we read about before the Civil War and the Fugitive Slave Act. The Fugitive Slave Act was clearly unconstitutional, but the federal government and state governments enforced it and forced uh, individuals in Minnesota to take slaves that escaped from Arkansas and return them to their slave owners, and if they didn't, it was a violation of federal law. So people in Minnesota were punished for not actively seeking out, getting, and returning slaves to the southern states. Incomprehensible that that could be enforced under our Constitution even at that time, and yet it was for years. In the same way, they're enforcing unconstitutional laws um, governing the, the ownership, the, the keeping and bearing of arms uh, now, and uh, the real danger of that is that if we let that happen to the Second Amendment, then there's no reason for them not to do the same thing to the Fourth or the, the First or any other. Yeah, they're all under attack, and um, you know, yep. so uh, that's yeah. You're right. The whole Bill of Rights, the whole Constitution, needs to be protected. It, you know, you'll be swearing an oath to to do that. I know everyone is, but like you said, there's judges, there's Congress people passing different laws that try to chip away at it, um, and, and and some of them, mm -hmm. you know, take a sledgehammer to it. Um, so, uh, so if you care about civil liberties, I mean, you might be a candidate that people would want to look at. Um, what, let me ask you this. Besides, you know, trying to pass gun laws and stuff like that, which, you know, um, what are things just generally that you think, um, besides laws necessarily or, or laws against the Second Amendment or gun control laws, what are ways that, you know, you think would actually practically uh, reduce violence um, in the U.S.? I think one of the things that disturbs me most is is the idea that uh, that the city of New York can can pass laws concerning um, prohibition and gun rights and then enforce it in such a way that it is obviously uh, racially biased. You know, you look at the population, the makeup of New York City. And when they had the stop and frisk program, uh, it applied to blacks and Hispanics 
at a much higher rate than it did the whites. And uh, Mayor Bloomberg, you know, just reacted violently when it was uh, when it was struck down on the courts. It said awful things about the judge that struck it down. Uh, if someone had done that <laughs> in South Carolina or Texas or Arkansas, it would have been, you know, it would have been obvious to everybody what it was. If we allow that sort of thing to happen in Texas, in Arkansas, or in New York, it undermines our respect for and appreciation of law and of law enforcement officers, or more correctly, peace officers. I think our our whole way of doing business with law enforcement has has generated a culture now in most of these United States where police officers are feared in the way the Bible tells us to. You know, the, the Bible said uh, not to not to hassle the, the Roman <laughs> centurion because he bare not the sword in vain. Well, we all know that police officer has a gun, and rather than respecting him for the job, he's, the difficult job he's doing, I'm afraid these days we fear him because he bears that gun not in vain. We know he may shoot us. Uh, we know that if he doesn't shoot us, he may uh, file charges against us that are flimsy or even untruthful, and we may have to hire a lawyer. We may have to go to jail. Uh, and that's that's what's motivating too much of the relationship between peace officers, law enforcement officers, and the general public. Yeah, and it sounds like what you're talking about is being consistent, and of course that's the definition of integrity. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, um, and uh, what about the war on? Drugs? Do you have a position on that, or? Yeah, it's it's just as insane as prohibition was in the 1920s. You know, there were there were no uh, gunfights in the streets of Chicago and um, Eastern Oklahoma. Didn't have Pretty Boy Floyd before uh, prohibition took place. When you when you take something and and make it illegal, simply you know based on something like that, all you do is drive up the price. And uh, when the price gets high enough, then and then the really bad people get involved. And that's uh, that's how Pretty Boy Floyd and uh, the gentleman in Chicago got rich and famous. And we're doing exactly the same thing now. It's uh, more global. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of our drugs come from Colombia and the Golden Triangle in Asia and other neighboring countries. And uh, until we decide that the government at any level is not our daddy, it's not our mama, it's not there to look out for us and make us do the right thing, we'll continue to pay the price in unrest and loss of freedom that we did in the 20s and that we are now. And the last people who want um, to end the war on drugs, ironically, is probably, you know, the drug cartels and, and groups like yeah. that. My dad told and, and me, the, uh, yeah. go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say the stop and frisk also is a violation of the Fourth Amendment. But, yes, you're going to tell us what your dad said. Yeah, yeah the, when Lubbock, Texas, the Lubbock County was voting whether or not to go dry, uh, stay dry or go wet, uh, in my youth, he told me that the Baptists and the bootleggers would keep it dry, <laughs> and he was absolutely right. Being a being raised Baptist, you know, I understood why the Baptists were doing it, but he had to explain to me why the bootleggers didn't want it to go wet. Yeah, exactly. A lot of yeah, that might go over a lot of people's heads, but um, it's very true. That's the last thing they want. They'll have to get a real job, um, you know, yeah. and. Uh, sell something else um so well um and you also put fiscal responsibility um you mean uh you don't think 20 or 19 to 20 trillion dollars in debt isn't the perfect amount right now <laughs> should we try to reduce that or oh uh, we have uh we've got to because uh i spoke to the uh 
NAACP, my first public address after the nomination, uh, was at NAACP in North Little Rock. And uh, I knew that, that the people there probably didn't agree with me about a lot of things. And so what I talked about was that I was not just a politician, just a former mayor, just a former constable, just a former coroner. I was more importantly a father and a grandfather. And that what we were doing with our national debt was the most terrible thing we could do to our children, our grandchildren, and their children for generations to come because everybody knows we can't pay that debt. We continue to run it up, and somebody will pay it someday in some way, and I will be deceased long before that happens, but my grandchildren will have the honor of paying for all the profligate spending that I allowed a Congress and a president to indulge in during my lifetime. And uh, that is that is cross-generational slavery. No other way to look at it. Yeah, the, I mean, look at Greece and some of these other countries. I mean, the only reason we yeah. can handle it now is because the interest rates are below 1%. And, um, right. I mean, as the interest rate was even at like 2%. I mean, you know, <laughs> most of the pie yep. of the chart of the budget would be going to paying interest. And, yes, then we would be, uh, you know, in, in debt slaves, basically. And, um, uh, well, let me see if I have some other issues here. What about um, small and mid-sized businesses? I mean, I think that's an important fabric of our society, but... Uh, the number of small and mid-sized businesses or new startups um, that have been formed every year for like the last couple of decades, if you look at a chart, uh, has been going down. And do um, uh, you think that's unfortunate, or uh, what What would you say it's, you would do to help small and mid-sized business? It's not only unfortunate, it's deadly. The, uh, the best thing we can do for for those businesses, for the economy in general, for the consumers and taxpayers in our country, is is to get the government out of all those situations. Uh, because as you would expect to happen when government became uh, receptive to money from you know, large corporations, you know, when Citizens United, as a part of its impact, allowed uh, corporations to be viewed as persons when it comes to donating money to campaigns, then the amount of money that that flooded in to political campaigns from those corporations was huge. It was already large. It had to come through the corporations, individual owners and officers and managers. And this just just made it all the easier. And so now, naturally, politicians respond to where the money comes from. And your local mom and pop or the four-state moderate-sized business operating, doing its work, don't have the kind of funds, uh, the, the ability to impact legislation, to support political causes and individuals that the, the large mega corporations do. And uh, I... I see corporations not as people, as the court did, but as as fictions of government. You know, they are corporations only because the government passed legislation that enables us to have a corporation. And of course, the reason, one of the reasons, big reasons that people wanted to have corporations was to avoid personal liability in their uh, business dealings. So you start out by trying to protect a certain class of people from responsibility for their actions and from that it's a natural progression to the point uh, that now I don't remember who which uh, universities but professors from two prominent universities Northwestern was one and one of the Ivy League universities I believe did a, a study that showed that the Congress of the United States didn't give a darn what the people said or thought or wanted in legislation, they responded to the amount of money that came to them uh, from from interested parties in in legislation. So that uh, pharmaceutical contributions, defense contributions, uh, farm contributions, the 
the largest five or six special interest groups uh, had much, much, much more impact on what legislation was passed, and it had absolutely nothing to do with what the polls showed the American people wanted. Yeah, and that's very interesting. Um, think about it. Like, I never really thought about, like, you know, why do corporations <laughs> exist anyways? I mean, people can still have groups and businesses and be liable sure. for them. I mean, if you didn't have corporations, it's not mm-hmm. stopping someone from creating an organization. But, you know, it's kind of like someone saying, you know, I just want to create this fictitious character where I can do whatever I want, and then, and then if that fictitious character, you know, does something bad or gets in trouble, then I'll just dissolve it and then create another fictitious character, you know, instead. Yeah. And so, by proxy, I have this, like, uh, impenetrable, you know, alter ego that's out there, you know, that's, uh, yeah, has a get, get, go to get out of jail free card or something like that. So, that's um, it. It's, it would be like uh, the officers in the Gestapo saying, well, you know, that wasn't me that did that. That was the Gestapo, or that was the SS that did that, and, and it's gone now, so you don't have to worry about that anymore. And, of course, at Nuremberg, we didn't buy that, and we shouldn't buy it now in America. No. And um, now, uh, about foreign... Like, let me ask you this, uh, phrase it this way as far as foreign policy goes. Um, if you were in the Senate, and if you were able to persuade people um, through arguments uh, and facts uh, to see um, how we should do our foreign policy how and, and you were able to implement the way you see it instead of telling us what you would do um, how would you envision America in 10 years from now and um, and America with its relations with other countries in the world what would what would the effects of what you would promote look like at the uh, end of it I think what what I would like to see us do through through legislation and and more frequently just by following the law uh, would be what uh, George Washington talked about he called for honest open friendship with all talking about other countries in the world entangling alliances with none and uh, you know for the first 150 years of our uh, national existence, we were the largest neutral country in the world. You know, we were what Switzerland is now, what Sweden is now. We were habitually uh, a neutral country when other people thought uh, none of our business, nothing we can do about it anyway. I I told a group, uh, in fact, it was at the debate in Fayetteville when we got to uh, foreign policy, you know, there are awful things that happen in countries all over the globe every day. And there is literally nothing that the United States can do about it. Uh, We're not set up to be, I don't think we ought to want to be, the policeman of the world or the judge of the world or the military uh, compliance arm of the United Nations. I believe we ought to do business with anybody who will do business with us on a fair trade uh, basis, but that we should not become involved in the local affairs of any nation, anywhere, anytime. And uh, there have been, there, there were reasons to become involved in other countries before World War I when the United States became an international player. Uh, but it was when our personal, uh, our personnel, you know, our um, foreign uh, Americans overseas were seized by a government or something like that. Uh, Thomas Jefferson um, took some some military action in North Africa for that reason. And, of course, uh, any nation like any individual has the right to defend itself uh, from, mm-hmm. from fraud or force from other nations or individuals. But as far as becoming involved in the defense of Europe or Japan or Korea, um, we have have dug a mighty hole for ourselves there. 
and uh, the expense of doing so isn't just the billions of dollars that we spend keeping hundreds of bases open in dozens of countries around the world. It is in appearing to the rest of the world to not be a fair and honest broker when dealing with other countries. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of... Um in, 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 for anyone who's ever watched Star Trek, maybe have or haven't, but the Prime Directive, you know, we don't want to interfere with yeah. these other pla- planets. Um, but, uh, well, Frank, um, good, good, let me ask you in closing here, um, and it's something I ask everyone just to get a little glimpse of uh, something uh, overall, not overall, but just um, a glimpse here. Who's some of your past or present, favorite past or present people, uh, elected or not? You know, I think Thomas Jefferson is, I like him because he had such a soaring intellect and and he was such a great spokesman for individual liberty and the rights of man. He was approachable in the sense that he knew what we did as, with slavery and the Constitution was not right. He had slaves himself uh, and and he struggled with that. Uh, he didn't. He didn't solve it, but he saw it, and that we can look at him, and he's human. He he made mistakes. He uh, he wasn't a paragon of virtue that we can never approach. But even though he's not that paragon of virtue, he understood individual liberty closer to home, at least in this. You know, someone who's alive now, uh, Dr. Ron Paul. Is uh, is just a hero of mine, uh, and again, he is uh, he is one of those people who has understood and done things to to advance individual liberty. Um, not a perfect man; nobody ever has been, or I suppose ever will be, but a uh, a heck of a guide to the rest of us who are trying to find our way toward uh, that hopefully attainable goal of individual liberty. It sounds great. And, um, well, good luck in your campaign. And um, if on this November 8th, you know, there's you know just a little over 40 days left, a lot of people to reach out there. And, uh, again, we're talking with um, Frank Gilbert, a libertarian candidate for Senate, uh, the U.S. Senate in Ar- uh, running in Arkansas for the year 2016, Frank Gilbert for FOR Senate. Dot com. Um, any final words here, Frank? We appreciate your time. Friend, I appreciate what y'all are doing. It is incredibly important. And as our candidate for president is saying this year, we're never going to agree on all the small things. But I think there is a growing majority of Americans who understand we have to agree on the big thing, which is that the Democrats and the Republicans have put us in an awful position and it's time to either force them to begin doing the right thing or to send them home. Yeah, maybe um, you'll be able to just, you know, uh, ride the wave of reform. Um, and uh, so hopefully there is a big wave of reform here in 2016. Well, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Uh, good luck again in your campaign and, and the debates, etc. cetera. Uh, Frank Gilbert, everyone. Um, well, take care, Frank. Thanks again. Thanks, friend, and good night.